Welcome to the Calvary Ministry Program with Pastor Don Golden. For more information about this ministry visit our website calvaryministry.org. This program is viewer supported. We are located at 150 Golden Road, Jacksonville, North Carolina. Our email contact is dongolden at gmail.com. And now today's message. Good morning folks, this is Pastor Don Golden with you again from Calvary Ministry. We will be continuing our series of sermons and studies in the book of the Revelation, and today we will be with the church at Sardis. This is a church that was located about 30 miles southeast of Thyatira, the church that we talked about last week. It was the capital city of ancient Lydia. And I mention that because one of the prominent figures in you look at the history of Sardis was a man named Croesus, who established himself as king of Lydia with his capital city at Sardis. Now, why would I mention Croesus as a reference in history? Because Croesus is uh, recognized as being one of the wealthiest kings in all of history. He lived uh, in that time frame of about 600 to 550 BCE, and he was wealthy beyond all imagination. He is also known, and he is given credit in tradition, as the one who invented the round coin. So, he became uh, famous for inventing the round corn, according to tradition. He was the king of a rich, rich city at the time, but he was destroyed by Cyrus, king of Persia, in 546 BCE. So his great wealth and his great position there in Sardis, the capital of Lydia, did not last many years. I'm reminded of King Solomon. The Bible talks about all his great wealth and likewise his wealth and his great prominence and his particular reign as a king of Israel did not last very long. When Solomon died, it was all gone. When Croesus died, it was all gone taken by Cyrus, the king of Persia. But at any rate, that's a little bit of the background on Sardis and, you know, who they were as a people. The church at Sardis is the fifth church that Jesus writes to. And he says in chapter 3 and in verse 1, these words to the church at Sardis. Jesus says, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now, Jesus identifies himself in a unique way to each of these seven churches that he writes to. Number one, he writes in each case to the angel of the church. And if we go back to chapter 1 and verse 20, we identify the angel of the church as the pastor of the church. In the first Christian century, it was common for them to be called bishops. But he has the message that he is sending addressed directly unto the angel of the church in Sardis. Now keep in mind that Sardis was a former capital of Lydia, Lydia being the formal uh, province of Croesus, Croesus who was one of the wealthiest kings in all of history. According to tradition, it was the place where coinage was invented. So it's still a very wealthy, prominent place in the Roman Empire, 
in that part of Asia Minor. Jesus says he is writing directly to the angel of the church in Sardis. This message is directly to the pastor of that church, the bishop, as they called them in the first Christian century. And he identifies himself so that the pastor has no doubt but by where this message is coming from. He says, these things saith he. And when he uses that term he, he's talking about the literal Son of God, Jesus the Christ, the only begotten of God who is now sitting in glory with God. These things saith he, Jesus, that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. The seven spirits of God. Let's define that and see where that comes from and what it means. If we go to chapter 1 and verse 4 of the book of Revelation, it says there, and from the seven spirits are which are before the throne. It's John in his opening remarks to the seven churches says again that this message, this book, is the unveiling of the glory of Jesus to Christ. It is the revelation, the apocalypse. And it says there in verse or chapter one, verse four. Him which is and which was and which is to come, the eternal, infinite Godhead of Jesus, and from the spirits which are before his throne, from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Now, that's the first mention of the seven spirits. Let's go another step to Revelation chapter 4 and verse 5. And we have there, it says, And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, a picture of the very presence of Almighty God in the complete Godhead. And there were seven lamps of fire be burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Here the seven spirits are defined as seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. Remember that Jesus uses the term of fire often when he talks about the word of God and its ability to cleanse and make whole. He says, in verse 16 of chapter 1, And he had in his right hand seven stars, the seven angels of the churches, the pastors. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shining in its strength. So this, this idea of fire, the shining, the, the eyes being as a flame of fire. And he says that if we go one verse back up to verse 14, it says that the very eyes of Jesus were as flames of fire. Here it talks about seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. Everything is going to be revealed and known to Almighty God there is no darkness in the kingdom of God. There is no darkness that can hide sin and wrongdoing from the mind of Almighty God, the spirit of Almighty God. These lamps of fire burning are the revelation of all the sin that is in the world. Seven lamps of fire before, burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now, it says that the seven spirits of God are synonymous with these seven lamps of fire burning. What can we take from that? The spirit reveals all sin to us. 
mankind has long ago called the conscience, that part of us which becomes a moral guide for our lives. Man might think that he has found a conscience, a moral guide, a standard. But the Bible says that it is God that knows every sin. It is God that is the Savior for every sin in our lives. God knows our every sin. Those seven lamps of fire burning illuminate every wrongdoing within us. And they are the seven spirits of God, it says. Now, the number seven deals with the absolute perfection of God. And so here we have the absolute perfection of God that sees our every wrongdoing. It says in the book of Revelation chapter 5 and verse 6, it says again there, And I beheld, John speaking, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain. God sees all our sin. Here in their, this picture in the midst of the throne, throne there is a lamb as it, it had been slain. God provided the perfect sacrifice to overcome the sin of all time, all the sin that you and I can commit, all the wrongdoing we might be guilty of, all the failures to obey the commandments of God, all those transgressions, God has provided a means for those sins that he sees. And that means is the lamb that was slain. Jesus the Christ who was killed on the cross for you and for I, for our sins. It says there of that lamb that that lamb has seven horns, the power of almighty God, and seven eyes, same as God sees everything, knows everything, is one and the same with God the Father almighty. And it says that these all put together are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. There is no place you can go where your sin will not be known. There is no place you can go where you can hide from the possibility and the power of God's salvation in your life. God is the very power of salvation manifested in Jesus the Christ and given to all those who will believe. Now, there are three things to notice about this: these seven spirits. In Revelation 1, 4, they were before the throne. In Revelation 4, 5, they are out of the throne. In Revelation 5, 6, they are in the midst of the throne. It covers every aspect of God's being. The seven spirits of God, that symbology speaks of the total presence of God in our lives. The total presence of God in our lives when we accept forgiveness of our sins in the name of Jesus the Christ. And when we become a child of God, when Jesus writes our name in the book of life, which will be opened at the great white throne judgment, we will be there before the throne, out of the throne, and in the midst of the throne. The Spirit will be to us, acting upon us as the very children, as the very saints of God. 
people say, well, where do you get that from? 1 Corinthians 3.16, written by Paul, says that, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? We, as the children of God, as the saints of God, as those who believe in Jesus the Christ as our personal Savior, the Spirit comes and dwells within us. We become the absolute residence of the Holy Spirit. We become the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in us. What does the Spirit do? As it's called here, the seven spirits, it illuminates us to the understanding of God's purpose and divine will for our lives. It illuminates us to understanding God's divine favor as blessings begin to come into our lives. It empowers us to take that illumination, to take those blessings, to take that understanding. It empowers us to live the godly life, the righteous life, as Jesus the Christ, as the only begotten Son of the Father, has ordained it to be. Yes, God is spirit. And the Bible says in John 4, 24, that we must worship God in spirit and truth. We worship with that spirit that literally lives through us. And we become testimonies of that great truth that God's faith has changed us from what we were to what God would have us to be. Let's continue to read on in this verse here. After Jesus says that, he is the one that has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. He controls the very word of God that goes forth. Jesus says to them, there in the close of verse 1, I know thy works and that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. Oh, Jesus had a way of saying things to bring conviction upon us. Conviction. Jesus had a way of using the Holy Spirit within us to make, a, make us conscious of our shortfalls. And what he says to the church here at Sardis is that they have a name, they have a reputation, that they are a living, active church. But Jesus says they are dead. Now, what is he saying when he says that? If we go to chapter 1 and verse 5, it says there, And from Jesus the Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood. It appears, if we look at that verse, that the problem that the people in Sardis had, the children of God that were living there, is that they had forgotten and fallen away from their continual worship and revival of spirit in Jesus the Christ. He says, you have a name that you live, that you're an active working church, but thou art dead. 
in chapter 1 and verse 18, Jesus said this, I am he that lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. What Jesus is telling them is that they need to live as Jesus, the Christ, gave us the example of life, righteous life, holy life, perfect life on this earth. Chapter 2 and verse 8 of the Revelation. These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. What he's telling the church is that they want to really live if they want to live up to the reputation that some people hold for them. If they want to overcome their deadness, it is to be done in Jesus the Christ. It is to be done in Jesus the Christ. If we go back to the book of Ezekiel, If we go back to the book of Ezekiel, we have a very vivid picture written by the prophet Ezekiel of the problems of being dead. Ezekiel was a prophet in Israel just prior to the great carrying away into Babylon. General time frame, 600 BCE. But the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel when he was a young man, and Ezekiel had this vision. Chapter 37 of the book of Ezekiel. Listen to what the prophet of God had to say. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. What a vision he was going to have. But he's in the spirit the same as John was in the spirit when he received the revelation. It says there in verse 2, And caused me to pass by them, this valley full of bones, Round about, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. There was no life whatsoever in these bones. They were dead. And he said unto me, God said unto Ezekiel, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Is that what Jesus is trying to tell them in verse 1, the church at Sardis, can you live, O Lord God, thou knowest? And again, God said unto Ezekiel, prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Isn't that the same thing that Jesus says at the close to every one of these churches that we've looked at so far? And Sardis will not be an exception. Hear the word of the Lord. Verse 5. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones. Now keep in mind these are dead, dry bones without any sign of life. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. They will have life if they revive themselves in the power of their salvation in Almighty God as given to us in the only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. 
God gives the command. Down in verse 9. Oh, breathe upon these slain, these dead bones, that they might live, says in verse 10. And the breath, the Hebrew word ruach, and the breath came into them and they lived. If people will only turn from their positions of philosophy and compromise with the world, if they will only turn in their fullness of the spirit that is available to them, to Almighty God, they will live and they will breathe. They will have the strength to serve Almighty God. Who is this message Ezekiel wrote for? It says in verse 11, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. You see, just as Jesus says here to the church of Sardis that they appear to have life, that they live, but they are dead, so the prophet Ezekiel, 690 years before the time of the writing of Revelation, said the same thing about the whole house of Israel. Verse 14, God says to Israel one more time, and you shall put my spirit in you, and you shall live. The spirit that Jesus is talking about is that spirit that was known back in the Old Testament, the Ruach, that gives us the very power to live a life of illumination, a life of understanding, a life of empowerment of the very presence of the Spirit of God. Now, I want you to turn with me to one other place, if you would, and that is the book of Matthew. And you say, well, that was Ezekiel, and that was John in the Revelation. Jesus said the same things in another place to those whom he loved, those who were among his own people, the Hebrews of his day in Jerusalem. If we go to Matthew chapter 3, I want to read to you some verses. This is Jesus talking directly to the religious leaders of the temple at Jerusalem. Jesus says in Matthew 23 and verse 27, He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful on the outward. Wasn't that the problem Sardis had? They appeared beautiful on the outside. But Jesus says, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous. Isn't that what Ezekiel said to Israel? Isn't that what Jesus writes to the church at Sardis? Outwardly you appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. You are full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Verse 29, Matthew 23. Woe unto you, scribes, and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous. Verse 33, 
Jesus says to them, Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? I want to finish up by saying this about what we have read today. And it comes in verse 2 and the opening part of verse 3 in Revelation chapter 3. Jesus says to them, after talking about their deadness, their need for revival, their need to turn again to the very Spirit of God that is within them to lead them, to encourage them, and to guide them in the path of righteousness. Jesus says in verse 2, Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. See, just as Ezekiel talked to Israel and told them that it all was not lost, that there was a way to overcome their wrongdoing in the direction they were heading in. Jesus is telling the church at Sardis the same thing. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. What's the solution? Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard. And hold fast. Here's the key word. And repent. Turn again to almighty God. Turn again to almighty God. Accept the spirit within you. Realize the significance that you are as the temple of God. Recognize that that spirit lives within you, dwells within you, that you are continually in your actions, literally, before the throne of God living by the power that comes out of the throne of God and standing in the midst of the throne of God. Live with these things before you at all times. Worship God in spirit and in truth. Experience the empowerment of the spirit that God can give to you. Pray with me. Lord God, I pray that everyone with ears who could hear has heard this message, has heard your words of truth. And God, I pray that the Spirit would fall upon all. And that salvation, and that salvation would be made known among multitudes without number. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you for watching the Calvary Ministry Program with Pastor Don Golden. For more information about this ministry visit our website calvaryministry.org. This program is viewer supported. We are located at 150 Golden Road, Jacksonville, North Carolina. Our email contact is dongolden at gmail.com.